happened this past Friday on our campus and its impact on so many is for me nothing less than a tragedy. When I learned what had happened, I was horrified and sickened. I am so very sorry for our students who were sprayed, those who were witnesses, and for all our students, for all our families, and all of us who have been impacted. I'm sorry for the staff, the faculty, and the alumni, the community members, as everyone has been impacted by that event. As many of you know, maybe not so many of you who know, but many on campus know, for over 30 years I've been affiliated with this campus, first as an undergraduate, then as a graduate student, then I returned as a faculty member, and I was an administrator. And for sure, all that time I've seen some dark days. Last Friday, however, <coughs> was without doubt the darkest. That is not the Davis I know, and it is not the UC Davis I love. I am still deeply troubled and still searching for answers. I look forward to working with the various reviews with complete openness and with complete honesty to understand what happened as a first step in ensuring that this never happens again. I admit I find my own emotions oscillating between deep sorrow for our campus, between frustration and even anger. And like many, I too find myself wanting to find someone to blame or some group to blame for this tragedy. Hey, hey. In these hard times, there are many to blame. Some, some may choose the police, some may choose administrators. Some may choose the disinvestment in higher ed, higher tuition. Some may choose increasing disproportionate distribution of wealth, the power of corporations. Some may blame the bad financial times. And for me recently, some may blame thinking about my own thoughts, various types of fear are part of this country. But frankly, I am weary of blame. At some point in the coming days, coming weeks or months, I hope we can all find our way to move beyond the blaming and to instead focus on the healing. For me, this has begun with a prayer for all those who are impacted. A prayer for all our students, all the members of our community, and yes, even praying for the police officers who were involved. Like many, in order to mend, I need active work. I need to know that I'm serving this campus as best I can in a productive manner. And with this as my goal, I have made a commitment, an absolute promise, to do all that I can, everything possible, to ensure that such event never happens again at UC Davis and my campus. It is my hope that through hard work and by caring, for caring for all of us and for each individual, the community as a whole, that is UC Davis, will again, will again be made whole. I have hope for the healing, and I have hope for one major reason, and that's because of our students. While there is much shame to share, much shame to share, I have been very proud of our students throughout all of this. I have been proud of their efforts for peaceful demonstration and protest, and for their continuing efforts to maintain peace during this trouble. And so, it is my sincere hope that each of us, each of us finds a way to look forward and to heal. And it is my hope that together, we can collectively work with integrity and understanding and change 
to heal this campus community. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chancellor Wood. Um, so you're going to have to bear with us while we do this. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to call, I guess, about 10 numbers. And then if you have one of the numbers, um, if you can come to either of the two microphones. If you'd like to wait until the you know later in the, um, in the evening, then you can just let one of the facilitators at the microphone know. And we'll make sure that that happens. Um, and we'll just call additional numbers, and you can speak later. Uh, we have time for about 40, and we're asking that everyone keep their statements or questions at two minutes. You can address a question you know, open to the panel, or you can address it to a specific number. Um, so the first uh, four would be 918, 910, 929, 909, uh, 922, 902, 885, and 907. Uh, does anyone with those numbers, if you'd like to come speak? And I can go ahead and read them one more time. It would be 918, 902, 910, 929, 922, 909, 907, and 885. So we'll just go ahead and start with that. Um, whoever would like to start speaking, you can go ahead and begin. Uh, hi, my name's Chase, um, and I am a senior here at UC Davis. First of all, I'd just like to say that tonight and this week I'll probably be in the minority here. And um, I'm going to say thank you to our Chancellor because she has made an extremely difficult decision and has weathered this storm of this week in a manner who, that I believe is extremely professional. And as I saw the events unfold over the weekend, mainly through the internet and through speaking with students um, at UC Davis, I realized that reflecting over my four years here, I was here through our last chancellor through my freshman year and as Chancellor Kateki has adjusted to becoming our chancellor. And through that time, I've seen her do some great things for our university and seen that she only has the best interest of us and of our university in mind. She has launched the campaign for UC Davis, which is a goal of one billion dollars to help support you guys as students in a time. Help support Monsanto and Amgen. In an effort to gain scholarships as tuition increases, she has an undergraduate advisory board, student assistance to the chancellor, a graduate student advisory board. All that she tries to listen to in order to make decisions that affect you guys and hear from you guys. And I don't think that she has made any decisions to be against you. So I think that the, looking back at her time here and as her decisions, though they were difficult, I want to thank her for making those difficult decisions because the first thing my mom did when she heard about it was that she called me and she said, I'm glad that your chancellor made a difficult decision that would provide a safe community on your campus. So thank you. Pepper spray is not a school! We'd like to allow all members of the audience the opportunity to make their full statement, um, so please refrain I'm from shouting out your end of the statement. I'm coming for a two hours. Is that you, sir? Can we suggest you leave then? And okay, we're going to alternate between the two mics, so we'll go to the second. Good evening. My question is directed at the Chancellor. Given the 64% dropout rate among Latino students here at UC Davis, and given the proposed 81% fee hikes, how do you realistically expect us to assimilate those increased tuition costs? And if, and if you are okay with that, how, are you okay with a potential 75% dropout rate among Latino students at UC Davis. What are your proposed direct actions to combat this? I'm not supporting the 81%. In fact, I'm totally against it. Um, I don't believe there is a proposal, but if there is one, I will be 
totally against it. So that's number one. We have worked very hard. I acknowledge the dropout rate. It's a serious problem. And we have been thinking about this for the last two years, at least since I came. Obviously, the university has been talking about this before I came. But we are working very hard to make sure that we improve that, because this is really an indicator of the quality of the university. The more students graduate successfully, the better of the university, of a university. <coughs> And so I have to tell you that personally I do care about these issues of the student's ability to stay and graduate successfully and on time. And we are working very hard to make sure that we measure it every year and then we make um, the appropriate, we give incentives to the units and the programs to uh, take care of the students. I just wanted to tell you that. I'd like to add something. Uh, I would make sure that we publish the correct figures, but those are not correct. Uh, I've looked into this number. I've heard this allegation before. It is false. Uh, that you, this assumes that everyone who doesn't graduate in four years doesn't graduate at all. And uh, I'm not going to try to give you the numbers. They should be posted, but I will get them on my page. And it's true that we have to worry about the graduation completely completion rates of all of our students, and it is true that uh, underrepresented minorities do not do as well as the average, but the difference is relatively minor, and we compare very well with all of the public universities across the country. Where the same thing has happened. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Chancellor Kutahi, I have with me in physical form the petition for your resignation. There are 80,000 signatures. Do you acknowledge or accept this petition? I acknowledge the petition. Of course, if you have the signatures, it's there. Are those all? University of California, they. There are not, there are more than, I mean, there are less than 80,000. How many are there? I can't say, I haven't read all the names. Can you just remind them, students get a chance to speak to let them finish what they need to say. Have a big over to me. from a police car as I was detained. And I just want to know, um, why is it that riot police were called from districts as far away as Berkeley and Oakland if you did not um, expect an escalation of violence or you were not trying to arrest or pepper spray the students? I just have to say, I need to explain a little bit how what is the uh, UC, how the police works in the UC system. The police does not report to me, it reports to the vice chancellor for our resource management. So let me just say, um, the, the, uh, when a, the only thing that a chancellor can do, and that for, is to make a decision of whether the police needs to help in that particular case with the dismantling of the equipment. Beyond that, I don't have um, the, um, the right to direct the police to do anything. As a matter of fact, the University of California protocol specify that I do not do that. So it was the um, decision of the chief, of any chief at any time, to um, decide on how many people to have and what uniform and how to do that. I did not have any interaction with the chief of the police or gave any directions about those issues that you mentioned but or anything that happened call, after that. You did call the police out to a peaceful protest 
on a quad that we as students pay for to be on and are allowed to be on to protest peacefully. I did not personally have a tent. As a reminder, again, we ask that members of the audience have the opportunity to ask the questions that they would like to ask. And can, I, can I respond, though, too? For, for an event when it's on campus, the chancellor would, would not necessarily be aware. But when we have police staffing, we're relatively small. And when we have an event such as a protest, peaceful protest, uh, there's always some safety concerns. Uh, for that event, I, I can't speak specifically, I wasn't there, but I can tell you that uh, we do use what we call mutual aid. And typically that'll be from our, our sister universities, whoever's close. And I believe on that day it would have been probably UC Berkeley and, and uh, UC San Francisco. That was not a good answer, but thank you. <laughs> from, the, from the gasp that went up when the Chancellor mentioned Vice Chancellor, I, I feel obligated to say I'm Vice Chancellor of Student Affairs and the police do not report to Student Affairs. And it's not this Vice Chancellor either. John, you want to stand up? <laughs> Chancellor, well, Chancellor, you asked, uh, Chancellor, you asked earlier how many of the signatures were from UC Davis students. I think that's an amazing question. I love that question. Um, I propose, I, I think several other students here would agree with me, that we should de democratically ask if we think you should resign. I think we should put a petition throughout the UC Davis community, and I think we should decide democratically, as a community, if we think you should resign. Does anybody else here think that's a good idea? Yeah. I heard it from the most of clapping, I think. I think that's part of um, I, I wanted to ask you two questions. The first question being, why do we have police with weapons in the first place? To me, the true tragedy here is not that people are pepper sprayed, although that's horrible. The problem is that we have armed police forces in the first place. Many universities, such as Columbia, Yale, Princeton, all have unarmed police forces. They have not descended into pits of anarchy. They function normally. The students and the police have wonderful relations. Um, why do our police need weapons? I can take that question. Uh, armed police on the campus is paramount to our safety. Uh, and in law enforcement, that's not a lot of the But unfortunately, in today's world, in 2011, there are things that happen at places like Virginia Tech. And our ability to respond to you if we had an unarmed force on this campus is so diminished. Uh, I've recently been a, I came from my assignment at the medical center to come back over to the Davis campus. And even at our medical center campus, the same thing applies. We have to have that ability to provide for safety on this campus. I, I want to think, and I'll get boots on this one, uh, but having been here now 10 years, there are times when we do enjoy a good relationship with our students. Uh, I think that that will bear out in the, in the long run. Understand that those people that are armed tonight on the campus, and there's a few of them, those are police officers. Their moms, their dads, their sons, their daughters. I'm not trying to be corny here, but we're all, you know, regular people. And at that time, sure, police officers, absolutely. But I have to be able to do my job to protect. So if you ask why there's armed, that's why it is. There are other campuses that don't have armed uh, police officers. You're absolutely right. But they also don't have that same ability to respond that we do. I, I would suggest that the uh, City of Davis Police could function just as well in that capacity, but I could do that. <laughs>
it suggests that um, other universities have something protest in campus, and it does not for the university. It's not a safety risk for uh, Duke, for example, has a several month in campus uh, relates to bat- basketball. So they correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and I, I would have preferred that if the university sent out administrators to ask how they keep the campus safer rather than sending riots to the weather. <laughs> Just to that point, I was uh, recently on a uh, conference call with all the other executive vice chancellors of the system, and uh, though there are minor variations, there are anti-encampment or non-encampment policies across the UC. One of the things that the president of the university has called for is a review of our policies, and I think it's important at, at this time that that committee look at those policies, and so we should know whether it makes sense or not, and if they continue, what the rationale is. So I share your view that it's important that we understand why if we continue. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, Chancellor, I have, I'm giving you an opportunity to uh, deal with questions that were raised this afternoon at the, uh, the, the board. Um, there is the question of, like you raised, of having corps on campus. And there is the allegation flowing around that you were part of a group that wrote a paper that ensured that Greek or Greeks, or in Greece, there is or there are corps on university campus. That was the allegation this afternoon. I'm just providing you an opportunity to answer that now. And the second thing, thing that came up this afternoon was that you are on the board of the FBI and you are now FBI on campus. It came up, I didn't mean this up, it came up this afternoon. And, and the third and, it's not the final, but the third thing here is um, that was there a code by the Davis, by the university police that reports to whatever chancellor or vice chancellor or provost or but even if they don't report to you, that decides how to deal with peaceful protests on campus. Is there a code? Is there an operational code that is there set? And if it's there, let me know. Uh, let, let, the, let the crowd know. Uh, and then finally, there have been acts of hate on campus. I mean, the newspapers reading apps and um, things about, about minorities, and this is our protected space in higher education. And the police, as far as I know, shrug them off as uh, acts of uh, bias instead of acts of hate. So, what's the criterion for 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 that? Uh, uh, if you could ask me, that's a little variable. Help me. So there are multiple questions, right? So I will do the first one, and then we will uh, ask my colleagues to take some of the others. So the first one. Let me just tell a little bit about the story. Um, I need to, is it? Yeah, sorry, my voice was down. Um, so, in the, um, I will start a little bit far. In 1973, when students were protesting, they were not anarchists. They were the mainstream that was protesting against the militaristic government. So, I want to put that on record. And I was part of it as every other student in these universities. It was not the anarchists that did that. <laughs> Beyond that, in most of after those incidents, and for a very good reason, they decided to create an asylum in universities, which meant that no police or anybody else, law enforcement group, could enter these universities and harm the students. And that worked very well for many years. Until recently, the universities were taken over by anarchist groups and they were burned down. For those of you who want to go on the web and get the information right, you can go and see. My own university was burned twice until they had to abandon it and go to a different place. We had a library that had books from the 1500s and they were all burned to ground by people who did not care about higher education. And so after many of these incidents, and to the, at the end, they had people who died in those um, burnings. The government, which is not a, a right government, it's a socialist government, 
as a matter of fact. Decided to ask nine presidents from all around the world, and I was one of them, to go look at higher education. And what we suggested is not to bring the police back, but we suggested that the chancellors of those institutions take care of their own um, buildings and of their own campuses, because these are the property of the public. And no one has the right to destroy something that belongs to the public. So that is the record. We have operational code for for events on campus in terms of public protest. Just really quickly, um, we have people in the back that are waiting to be seated, so if you can scoot into the center of the aisles, um, just so that they can get in quicker and everyone can get seated, really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, and then also, just because of the time, we want to get through as many students as possible, and we can keep the questions, you know, just to a couple, um, in order to save more time for other speakers. Uh, yeah. 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 It's about the FBI board. <laughs> <laughs> so, there are the, the presidents of the U.S. Just universities the have a, what we call, there are two organizations. One is the American Association, or the Association of American Universities, and the other is the Association of Land Grant and State Universities. And there is a group of these 60 presidents of those who we belong to a group that is called National Higher Education Security, which in fact, after it was established immediately right after Virginia Tech, and those 60 presidents come together and we talk about these kinds of issues from security threats to IT threats on our campuses to safety issues to epidemics when there is one and so forth. And sometimes we bring agencies like law enforcement agencies that come to our campuses and we have an, an interaction with them to understand what is it that they want, how can we provide information so we don't disturb our campuses as they are looking for information and so forth. And that is probably what you are referring to. And I'm going to try to uh, answer a couple of those other questions. Uh, bias versus hate. So any, any crime, any, any hint of a crime related to hate or bias is always fully investigated. However, we're bound by, it may not seem like it, but we're bound by the state, as we want to fit it into a specific code through, this, through legislation, through the penal code, it may not necessarily fit that particular criteria. I'm not saying we're perfect at everything, but this is something we do investigate. As a matter of fact, I'm going to meet with students uh, at the end of next week, so we have that open dialogue and talk further about this, because I don't want the perception out there that we... We do not uh, investigate those things. We do, and if we're failing somewhere, then we'll make correction if necessary. In regards to uh, protests on campus, you know, my thought is, I I'm, since Sunday night, the acting chief on campus. Uh, my wife said no. Uh, I got home, and my 17-year-old said, Dad, you never want to be a police chief. I go, I know. Uh, <laughs> so here I am. Uh, this is what I say. Moving forward, let's communicate. Let's have open dialogue before we have a protest. Let's let's open the door and say, hey, if this takes place, this is what could happen. And this is what my response to, has to be as the police department. And can, can we work together? Let's go out and talk with uh, folks that are, are currently on the, on the campus quad. Uh, I'm open for that. I mean, if anyone in this room knows me, uh, you know what I'm saying. It's true. So uh, I don't know that I answered everything, but I did my best. Um, so there is not one code in place, that's why the problem arose, and so if FBI comes on campus and they can do that much for security on campus, why not the code to take care of a minor issue like a public protest, peaceful one like that? Well there's practices in place, there's, there are policies, and as you, as you heard earlier, all of our policies are under review, everything uh, within the police department is under uh, multiple review. <coughs> So you have promised that oh, we've noticed that there might be more than what the numbers were called. 
coming up to the microphone, so just to be sure that only come up if your number has been called. Bingo! Got it. <laughs> um, so you've given us your, your word that you're going to try and steal your trust, you're earn your trust back in us. And so I'm wondering, you know, we, we hear a lot of words, so what are the actions that you're planning, both from you and from the police chief, and moving forward? So I, I, I promised, first of all, one thing that I've learned, I have to say, and that is going to change me moving forward, is that I need, as the chancellor, to spend a lot more time with the students. <laughs> this is not a, a, a normal time for a university from the point of view that we are going through so many difficult issues as a society, as a campus, uh, specifically a campus of the UC system, there are so many things going on that we need to work a lot closer. I need to work with you a lot more to really understand your needs, to really get your ideas. There are wonderful ideas with the students and try to work together to move forward. I mean, I can, of course, I, I can promise to you and my my effort will be to show to you that I am good with all of my promises. And the one thing that I can promise, which I think is critical for the university, is first of all to really understand what happened about this incident, to make sure that we take the appropriate actions and to make the changes that we need to so that never happens again. But beyond that, here is my hope, that one thing, we should not let this incident define us as a university. We should, but we should let define us as the universities what we do next. And we should work together to really not just fix the problems of this campus, especially when it comes to law enforcement, but to really develop the model for the 21st century, which means that we are a society we are today with our problems, with our sensitivities, with our expectations about personal freedoms. And we need to have a campus, we need to have a law enforcement body, we need a department, we need to, all of us have processes and policies that respect all of those. And it's new for a university, I have to tell you, what you see as law enforcement is what was created after the Virginia Tech incident. And now is the time to think back and say, that was back then, and now our needs are different. And how are we, as an institution, create uh, the environment that is not just good for us, but it's going to create a model for everybody else? This is an opportunity for us to define that for the rest of the country. And I can only promise to you that I will do everything I can in my own power to work with you to make this happen. Join so, us and fight the 1%. Stand up and fight the 1%. That's the problem. Instead of, but, you know, I agree with the uh, with the words comment. I, I think I've lived by that thought process. Words are words. Uh, action. So, you know, we open our doors. We communicate. We move forward. Uh, we get. We we work in advance together. Um, you know, a lot of things. The proof is in the pudding too. You don't realize we we employ 80 to 90 students that are here working tonight. They're Aggie hosts. We have, uh, a year ago, uh, or almost two years now, I started the Volunteers and Police Services, which is staffed solely by students. As a matter of fact, it's run by a senior who, who is trying to get that, uh, we're trying to grow that program. We started a, a Citizens Police Academy where we invite uh, students, in fact, anybody to come in, be a part of that process and learn and see what we do and, and, under, and to have an understanding of what we do. As a matter of fact, I think we even got it so we we offer credits, uh, you can obtain credits free, there are your free credits, uh, free credits to that program. Uh, so it's in the actions, it's really going to be what you see uh, that I do and my police department uh, does on this campus and, and have done. And, you know, the, the biggest point here is, that you're right, it's not words. So I just invite you to watch, I invite you to participate with me. You'll see me out there, I'm here. My family's here. We're here at football, basketball, you name the events. Uh, why was picnic day a success? It's because we work together. How many of us work together in advance of picnic day? Well, that was one heck of an event. So that's our model. That's our example moving forward. So,
the mystery here. Um, before we continue with questions, can we call up the next 10 numbers to start lining up? So 789, Tragic. I think you're all wondering why the police chief is not here speaking. We're wondering why that vice chancellor that you say is the one that this order is that the police are accountable to is not speaking. And where are they and what do they have to say about that?
you have a community from even more tragic events. It didn't end well, you know, I, I stipulate to that. Um, but that was really the thought. So the discussion was, um, in working with you know, campus leadership, trying to, as was done, give notice that you know, camping is not allowed, that we really would like the tents removed. Many individuals did that. Um, I think there were decisions made on, on you know, part of the organizers that you know, we want to make a statement here, and, and we had the police chief go ahead and ask that those uh, tents in the camp be removed. Um, and general direction was, you know, our principles were, we don't want to see scenes like we saw at UC Berkeley. But we do want to take action. <laughs> what are you talking about? I, I'm just telling the story. You can, you can judge after you hear it. And, I, and I'm fine with that. But I'm just telling you the line of logic that we were thinking. I mean, and so, so as we talked about it, the decision was to you know, try to you know, see if police could engage in that. But if the scene became too difficult, we didn't think it was going to end as it ended. That you know, it was really to sort of, if, if there was conflict, that we were sort of pulling back and not to have it go where it went. Once these actions begin, however, I have to tell you that, as the chancellor referred, there was great discretion given to officers, both for their safety and, and the scene, to, to make decisions in the field. We can all you know, probably stipulate, was this the right decision? Is it compliant with policy? That is all going to be revealed through some of these reviews. Do I feel terrible about it? Absolutely. So I'm an undergraduate here. I met the love of my life here. We were married in the Arboretum. Do I love this place with all my heart? Yes. Am I like Fred? I'm upset with what's happened, but that you know that was the decision point. Uh, were we disappointed with the outcome? Absolutely. Um, if we had it to do again, would we do it that way? Of course not. Uh, I really appreciate and love your honesty. Uh, I'm happy to hear that you that this happened because of problems that did not exist yet. And I've been looking at the UC Davis like, Facebook page, the official one, and Twitter and stuff, and people all around the United States who are eligible to go to UC Davis are saying, I'm not going to apply there. No way. I don't want to be scared to go to a university like UC Davis. And I've seen students walking with like goggles on their faces and stuff. And so what I'm wondering is I commend your efforts to reconnect and establish trust with current UC Davis students. Um, what steps are going to be done to connect with the students across the United States? And as a further part of that question, I noticed a lot of alumni who are sitting there, I recognize that a lot of university funding comes from alumni donations. A lot of alumni, numbering in the thousands, have said they're not going to donate any more money to the university. So, what are you going to do to uh, reconnect and establish trust with alumni and potential students across the United States and not just in the Davis community. So, um, you are absolutely correct. These two uh, specific issues are very important to us. So, I think number one, the, the one thing that we really have to do is to show that we are very serious about changing the situation here on our campus and create an environment where everybody knows there is going to be safety and people will be free to express themselves, of course in a way that is respectful to the campus and to others who are around them, all right, without violence, that's all that I'm saying. Right now, we have made the commitment, all of us here, the, the President's office and, and my personal commitment that I will work with the students to um, create ideas and suggestions. Of course, the, the, the Office of the President is reviewing all of the protocols, but I can tell you I want to play a very active role in advising him on, and, on, on what we would like to see on our campus and beyond that to do this. So I think we have to be, I believe, that our institution has to be very proactive in showing what we are doing in making those changes and making sure that this information goes out to the kids in the state of California where most of our students are coming from and of course to be very proactive in 
connecting with the schools and providing the information, and this is something that we have to do. In terms of alumni, um, many of our alumni have not necessarily said that they are not going to support this institution, but they said that they would like to see change. I've seen several thousand people refusing to donate to the university until changes are made. It's on the internet, and you can look it up yourself. So, the, so what are you going to do to address that? Well, we are going to make the changes that they would like to see. And we have been in communication, so it is very important for us the same way we stay with, in communication with the parents of the students. And Well, the students are different because they are on campus. We need to stay in communication with the alumni. The alumni is the Calagi Association and the uh, Calagi uh, Association Board are very involved in trying to um, work along those lines. Stay connected and then show exactly what kind of change we If I can just add, uh, I think it was on Sunday evening that we sent an email message to upwards of 100,000 alumni, and we gave them an email address, inviting them to send their questions and concerns. A relatively small percent did, um, something like 2%. <laughs> some were negative, some were not. Uh, I think the most important thing, as the Chancellor said, is to continue that, that information stream, reach out, communicate, and for those for whom we've lost their trust, we will do everything we can to regain it. I think if you look at the long history, that's something the alumni know above all. This was, as we've said, this is not UC Davis. This was UC Davis on Friday. We, it was an aberration. We want to make sure that it doesn't happen again. And we believe that we can convince people that that's the way it will be. Vice Chancellor, it seems like you're trying consistently throughout this town hall like twist the facts. They've been risky. So I'm very like I'm very happy with the response of like, the other three panelists, really honest and uh, down to earth. But it seems like you're trying to cite non-existent data uh, and undermine. Uh, what people are bringing up by citing like, that email thing. I don't know. It's just... You saying that's not existent? No, it's that you... Work what? That works. Um, so, it's more of the fact that you are trying to like, cite data from like one little study or one email uh, correspondence and then say that to ignore the fact that thousands of other people are refusing to give that to be millions of dollars. I don't, uh, I, I don't have the credibility with you to continue on this, but um, uh, I am sorry for that. I will only say that I was trying to answer your questions. What we will do, what we have done, and let's just leave it as communication and information. And the last part is what does the University of California Gives Police Department plan to do? Sorry, we're doing a two minute event and it's been quite over two minutes. Uh, just as a reminder, so we are asking that uh, audience members that are speaking, uh, please keep your time to two minutes. Um, and then as we kind of talked about at the beginning, we are requesting now that it's after six o'clock that uh, members of the audience not film or live stream. Uh, we'd really appreciate it in order to allow students that would like to ask something uh, that's not recorded. Um, we are open to doing town halls that um, will be fully broadcast online and engage Twitter and things like that. Um, so uh, thank you and we uh, appreciate your understanding. I would like my question to be important because I think the answer to this question is important so that people can see it. So Chancellor, um, I'm here not to verify you or not to take part in the public lynching. That is not my idea. I don't think that's the idea of most people, hopefully, here. So I speak to you human to human. You are a person and a person. And so, as that preface, this is my question. You talk about re-establishing trust. And that means you should be thinking as one family. So, if you are one family, then things that you are going to do to move ahead but by a dissection of past events, need to be done in a very transparent manner. So this investigative committee that you're forming, for example, I tried to contact someone in your admin in the, in the Office of Public Relations or something of that sort, and they said they would get back to me with details of how it would be constituted, its powers, its reach, and how its uh, conclusions would be followed through. 
And I replied back and said, it's not about contacting me, it's contacting about all of us, because it's not about me, it's about us. So can you please, and this question is directed only to you, uh, and please feel free to answer us as though we were your family, because you are a part of our family too. I know, thank you. I, I'll tell you what I know, obviously, and, and exactly what I'm telling you is what, what it is, all right? It's no more of Can I, can I interject just one, one second? Because yes. Based on what you had mentioned about the formation of the panel with the top level police official in the U.S., it didn't seem to me as though people were taken into confidence before this panel was even constituted. That's not my opinion. I don't know if that's a fact. All right. Let me just describe. So, I announced, so there are a number of investigations going on in parallel. All right. So, let me just talk about the one you're referring to. So that one, it was announced very early as a task force review committee. But then, to make it more credible, it should not have been run by my own office, as you can imagine, because this is going to look at the whole event, not just what the police did. So I wrote a letter to the president, and I asked him whether his office was willing to do an independent review outside of our campus, looking in to our campus and trying to assess what happened in this incident. And he agreed to do that. He is going to contact faculty from here, students, student organizations, um, um, staff, and alumni, and others. And the, the only thing that he has decided to do is to ask this very well-respected individual who knows, uh, who is also he has enough background, very well respected in the U.S. I don't know him personally. To tell, but the committee, to set the committee in place, the president has been um, asking for advice from the various groups to be an excellent representation from Mr. Davis. Now, that is going to run independently. All of the results from this will be on the web. You will see all of this information. The results will not even come to me first. They will go to the president. And the president is going to send me the results, which will say this was wrong, this has to be corrected, and so forth. Can I, can I please interrupt and just one comment? So a lot of people think that decisions coming from the top down are things that they cannot quite trust and believe in. And I'm not saying whether this is my opinion or not, but this is widespread opinion that such is the case. So that being the situation, why would you think that an independent panel still uh, uh, decided upon or, or acted upon by UCOP, Office of the President, and its contribution to be trusted? This is, I don't need applause, please, because this is too serious for some kind of jingoistic uh, thing. I mean, I want us to really discuss this. I mean, if I do not trust someone and that person is going to start a panel, why would I trust its conclusions and what it's going to implement? This is, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but this is a very logical question, I believe. There are four other investigations going on. Four other. So that was the fifth. There is a DA investigation looking at um, the use of excessive force, and that is done by the DA. Is a separate investigation done by a special committee from Los Angeles looking at the whole police department. And that was done by them. There is a separate group, a faculty committee from the Senate that is going to make an investigation. And then there is an overall, of course, at the UC. So there are so many. And if, you know, I mean, we have so many independent. There is going to be something, the truth is going to come out at the end. Yeah. And all of this will be available publicly, I and mean, the reports will be there for you to find. I just request that anything that's done in the future, but still looking back, we establish we learn from our, our lessons, because we don't want this to happen again and we learn this, so we should learn from this. So thank you. And I wish that Vice Chancellor had taken the opportunity not to use her the other vice chancellor to be on the stage and the free questions, I think that would have been a problem. I would have to say, I'm sorry, I, it was, we tried to make sure that it, it was not him who said no. It was my decision to keep the group, um, it was small, and then maybe an, an assessment of who would be of bigger interest to you. 
It was not really anything designed. Well, I just think that uh, coming from from the largest democracy in the world to one of the best ones existing in human history, India, the U.S., uh, I just hope that people uh, hold themselves accountable before others hold them accountable. I think that is honestly is the most important thing in establishing a community. Thank you. The, the, we could organize this. I'd say there's room for a fifth chair. And what we also want to model, John, there's room for a fifth chair. And what we also want to model is that if the suggestions come forward, uh, we'll try to be flexible. I just want to remind everyone, we do have a lot of people that want to speak, um, and these questions are taking significantly longer than two minutes, so if we can try to keep them short. Um, a lot of people would like to get the, the opportunity to talk about this, um, so please keep that in mind and try to keep it to one question for the panel so that we can get through as many as possible, um, and we're also available um, as well. Thank you. Hello, yes, I would like to have my question recorded as well. Um, this is for the UC Police Department. I was wondering if you'd be willing to make available a list of the weapons, both lethal and non-lethal, currently in your possession, as well as their associated code of conduct to allow their use on the students. Yes. I, I can tell you right now. Uh, less lethal used by the UCAF's police department includes pepper spray, uh, the taser, the, the pepper ball gun, which is uh, an air, a uh, paintball gun that uh, deploys a little Bam! It's a pepper ball. Uh, it's like a paintball, but it has the pepper spray in it. Uh, we have the baton, uh, which is uh, standard. Uh, I want to say that's all of our less lethal uh, applications. And then, and then obviously we, we are armed with a sidearm uh, and then uh, um, uh, a rifle. And those are maintained. There's policy behind all of this. Um, it would probably take me a, a good amount of time to explain. And um, I don't know that I would be uh, as articulate as others, but less lethal is used when uh, the, uh, deadly force is not necessary. It's a, it's a less than um, type situation. And there is policy that directs that. I know that there is, as the Chancellor said, uh, all of our policy, and I can tell you specifically, those policies that guide our use of less lethal, the ones I just told you what we have, uh, <coughs> as well as lethal, as well as all of our policies under review. Are you willing to make that policy available to the public? Uh, you know, I think it's not currently. Uh, I'm not sure that it's not currently. If it's not, I will have to do some research and catch up with after two days. So obviously, I would have to talk with uh, legal to make sure if it's appropriate. Absolutely, why not? Yeah, I feel it would be very appropriate. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hello. I would also like my questions to be recorded. Um, hello, I'm a third year doctoral student here at UC Davis. Um, my questions are directed for the entire panel, but my concerns are um, meant to address the entire UC Davis community. Um, I will say that it's very disturbing the events that we've seen of uh, the Pepper Spray with the students, um, but I do take comfort in the fact that um, they have UC uh, student health insurance to help them with their um, medical issues outside of that. And I say that because I understand that violence done to Asian and white bodies um, inspires pains of empathy that are never activated when that kind of violence is waged against black people. And I say that because um, I understand that black people aspire to be admitted into this university so they can protest how it's being reorganized. I understand that the relationship between the police, the university, and black people um, has been a long and antagonistic relationship that is very well documented. Um, in Davis, which includes War versus the Backing, which is the big war case that successfully started dismantling uh, affirmative action, started with a white student at UC Davis Medical School, saying that his spot was taken by a black student. I know that there was a lawsuit that was settled out of court about um, UC Davis police drawing guns on a black graduate student, and the UC administration advised UC student paper to not report it. Um, at the same time, these non black students were getting pepper sprayed. There are a group of us across the way trying to take the student who's paper to task for not reporting anti-black hate crimes, which include uh, the yellow ribbon being said, use this as a noose, 
Ku Klux Klan and Red Street like inside residence halls. And so my point is, I know that black people have actively disappeared because there are more college-age black people in prisons in California than on the the university. And I understand that other students who are on this campus, they are overly policed and are afraid of being shot by those who use police. So my concern is, one, what is, what do you think the relationship is between UC Davis, black students, and the police? And two, knowing that there's a long documented history of an antagonistic and hostile relationship between the university, the police, and its black contingent uh, constituencies, what are you going to do uh, from this day forward? week with students and I uh, didn't have time this week and just, and just won't, but that is a big topic, the um, hate and bias crimes on campus and how those are reported and whether or not, you know, the perception is that we're not investigating those. So I am going to try to meet with, a, a, there is a student group uh, that was canceled just because of this week, the way it falls out and, and uh, as fresh as I am. But next, next week I will start with that meeting. And then we'll move from there. I mean, I, you know, I'm a regular guy. We're just talking about uh, a community that I love, uh, I've grown to love. I, I, I don't live here. I have, didn't go to school here. Uh, I wish I would have had the opportunity to go to school here. Uh, I hope one day my kids come to school here. As a matter of fact, when they're on campus, they look at you. Uh, they're inspired to come here. Uh, so, yes, I do intend through open dialogue, open doors, uh, and working together, really. That's what it comes down to. <clears throat> Sir, you would say if you'd like to hear from the Hope, Hope Hell, I'll try to say just a, a few words. I don't know if my colleagues will want to say more. But of course, you give a list of many, many decades, really a century and more, of, of racial hatred. Um, we are not separate from the rest of this country, which is marred by racism. Uh, there's nothing that we can do now to undo that. What we need to do is to keep that education going. Recently, um, I know about the cases. We've all looked at them that you refer to, the cases of bias. Um, we've talked to representatives, uh, Raheem Reed, Zola Castro. We talk frequently with them to make sure that um, we're looking at them and using them. If we can't, obviously, if there is something to follow up on with the individual um, who's caused this, uh, we do that. And, but more, this is the kind of education that we all have to engage in. And um, I think that it's a, a, it's a new day for every new class of students who arrive here. So the principles of community is something we all have to work on. Every year, we have our book project um, that may seem very, very trivial. It certainly is compared to the depth of pain and the history there, but this is an educational institution and California is the most diverse state in the nation. And my hope is that generation after generation of students, that education pays off. Um, uh, thank you for the two people who have already answered. Could I request that the remaining three panelists actually say the word black people in their response? <laughs> We have a lot of work to do to increase the number of black people on this campus. <laughs> and, and we have a lot of work to do to make this community embrace all people, all people of color, all people, particularly black people on this campus. I agree with you with that as well. It, it is certainly one of my goals um, as Vice Chancellor. One of the areas I do have responsibility for is admissions. And, uh, you know, there are times where I feel like both hands are tied behind our back in terms of the Bakke decision that opened it, which was positive, and then Proposition 209, which is very negative. But that's not an excuse. We have to work hard. We have to work harder to bring more black people to this campus. It enriches our entire campus community. It's something we need to do for society. It's something we need to do for the state of California. 
We need to do the same with Latino and Chicano students. And the same with Native American students. We have to identify the students of color and the more use of Davis, but not going to be the campus we want to be until we do. What I would like to say is that um, you know, the urge to discriminate runs really deep in the human DNA. And I think we need is one of those that we have to undo. It's every day, every in morning we wake up with something we need to be aware of. People will discriminate on the basis of many things, on the basis of wealth, on the basis of status, on the basis of race, on the basis of um, um, uh, uh, gender, on the, ba on the basis of uh, sexuality and so forth. They discriminate every day. It's not something you feel you can get done with and move on. It's something you have to deal with every day. And that's my um, the position. I would have to say our campus has suffered, our, all campuses in the U.S. for many, many years. It's, it's a long history that we carry with us. And every year we have events that remind, uh, remind us very painfully of the work that we have to do moving forward. But I have to say it's work we have to do every day. It's not something that you do, you get done with and you move on. It's something that you have to do continuously. notice in a community like that is that um, black people and people of color are, are the community. They are the fabric. And they're, you know, they're, it's, the, it's that there is a difference. It's that they're fully part of it. And we're far from that here, frankly. But we have to strive to sort of that environment where you embrace you know, the differences and it's the, that whole fabric of a community instead of you know, what we still struggle with here, where you don't have full representation of all groups, and I think Fred has said it as well, that, you know, start with, you know, we need more. My concern is when they get here, are they going to be drawn on them by the easy police just trying to get the class? That's all. Thank you. having this opportunity if tuition fees are increased. Um, but that's not my question. My question is, you made the call to remove protesters because you felt that it was unsafe for students to be there, including with non-UC Davis affiliated people. Now, what this basically felt like to me and to other students is that it wasn't the right time, it wasn't the right place to protest. And it's funny that I feel this way because that's what they were saying to women when we were fighting for equal rights. That's what they were saying to African Americans when they were during the civil rights movement. Moving. And I just want to know, when is it ever going to be the right place and the right time to protest? allow them to protest. That was never safe. But can I, can I interrupt? But by you removing the tent, which is the symbol for occupy anything recently, that's saying you can't be here. That's what I felt like. I was this is the end of the movement. That's, that's what I felt so like. I understand. So let me just say, the one thing that has become clear to me, all right, and that is a discussion we need to have seriously moving forward, especially as we are looking at law enforcement. 
is that having the tense is part of expressing an objection to something very specific or expressing an opinion about. I mean, it's not just, it, it is moving, in, it is becoming this way. So as we, as I said, uh, as we are looking forward, to reconsider how how we make this campus safe and what kind of uh, venues or forums we provide to our students to express their frustration, their objection, their opinion. We need to reconsider what those forums are. Obviously, along with uh, along the or according to the old guidelines. It was not one of them. That is the problem in the kinds of policies we have. And as we move forward, we really need to look very carefully and see what is it really, how do we want to express ourselves? And what is the best way of doing this without impacting others, obviously, in a way that is not wanted. But I, I understand what you're telling me. I really see your point. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chancellor, we get to meet again, and unfortunately it's under dire situation and major, major distress. Imagine my surprise when I turn on the Today Show this morning, and among News It Up, Libya, President Obama, the economy and whatnot, there's a story about Davis, California, and the pepper spray incident. Gee, 3,000 miles away, my campus that my father worked on, my mother worked on, and I'm working on, gets to be included on the Today Show because of a pepper spray incident. Today, I read the, the Chronicle like I usually do. And I get to see, actually it was yesterday, excuse me, two things. There was a major event that our president, Mark Udoff, attended. And he was, it was stated that he decided to attend this event because the Regis meeting had been canceled. He also went on to say that he did not like the security detail he had. And the columnist in the Chronicle included as the last line on the section of this event that Yudov said, and I quote, I just want to live my life. Gee, I just want to live my life too on this campus and do my job, but it's kind of hard when I see and today this was in the Chronicle, one of the editors made the remark that the pepper spray incident was like someone watering the rose bushes, something that I thought of when I saw this. Gee, how nice to know that the students need to be watered by a police officer with pepper spray. And lastly, <coughs> uh, I forgot my last point. Sorry, I'm going to uh, President on Canada here. But the point is, I want to do my job. Oh, yes, okay, now I remember. Principles of community. Every year that I've worked here, and it's been 25 years now, someone in my workplace has made the point that I must abide by the principles of community. And this person implies that I am not abiding by said principles. But this person feels that every year they must tell me that I have the responsibility to abide by the UC Davis Principles community. So I would ask, where was the police officers in their respect for the students? Where was the police officers in their abiding by the principles of community? People are allowed to protest, as our dear President Yudoff said. We're also encouraged, and like I say, every year I get this, Peter, abide by the UC Principles community. It's a reason that I sometimes I think I'm the only one that has to abide by it. Thank you. Hi, Chancellor. Seeing how these... Sorry to interrupt you really quick. We just wanted to remind everyone about how this police brutality <laughs> occurred in response to protests that were happening due to tuition increases in the first place. What are your long-term goals to somehow disassociate UC Davis from being dependent upon 
state budgets because as long as these budgets are slashed, we'll continue to have e hikes and more protests and more chances, you know, more potential instances of this brutality. Well, we are trying, you know, we have to find ways to do two things to reduce our cost of expenditures internally and then to try to get some. Um, funds from the outside, fundraising primarily is the way to get scholarships for the students and that is something we have to do on a, a continuous way. It's, um, it's very hard to um, really stabilize the budget of the university and keep the attrition where it is without doing those things, especially at the time when the state situation is not very stable. But in parallel, we are working with the state, if anything else, to keep us where we are. If the state decides to go and do something like the, the state has done in the last two years, I mean, our campus cannot remain stable in that regard. And of course, increasing tuition more is not something that is sustainable. And so, we have, there has been a lot of work and our students have helped and are helping and there are a lot of activities in parallel that we reach out to um, the state and we are asking them to keep our university and the state at least, we don't ask for more money, we know the state does not have more money at this point, but we are asking the, the state to help us stay where we are and of course we are asking the public to start providing more money to the state so the state can support higher education and education in general. On Monday, if um, Speaker Perez is here, that is a possibility, is an opportunity to make that statement and ask him that question. On what is the state doing to support these universities, these uh, institutions of higher education? Uh, uh, the sure, is, uh, 785, 923, 927, 926, 889, 915, 892, 886 and 978. Thank you. Hi, my name is Chuck Parker. Um, I'm an undergraduate student here, a junior student, a veteran. I'm also one of the people that was arrested last Friday. Um, I want to say a couple of things. Uh, first is some factual corrections. Um, you speak of outside students, outside agitators. And I want to say that those outside students and outside agitators uh, that you refer to on Friday were all UC Davis alumni. Those were agitators. I think the uh, Alumni Association might have something to say about that. The, uh, the second point is, is regarding to this as a singular act in Davis, the day that we were not Davis. Um, I would contest that. Over the past few years that I've been here, I have seen uh, a continued effort of police intervention and brutality from the 52 people arrested in Iraq Hall a couple years ago to the students beaten on March 4th, to the rest that happened last Friday. Additionally, there has been a sustained effort and systematic effort of student surveillance by Student Activism Response Committee, which has produced a chilling effect on freedom of speech on this campus. And while I understand that there are investigations and committees forming where some of these ideas will go to die, I want to know what you're doing right now today to make sure that students have the right to protest, have the right to free speech, and have the right to do that safely. Thank you. So I will um, address the issue of the um, police and uh, you made reference to a number of events. Um, as I said, we are going to really look back very carefully and see exactly what, what is it that we are trying to practice on a campus that has a set of needs and obviously um, a 
especially last week's events have shown us that we don't do this very successfully. And I can tell you that we are going to have to make changes and we have come to that conclusion right now. And those changes will be implemented in a way that allows for peaceful demonstrations that do not create fear either with those who are in, excuse me, who have, for those who are not participating. That's the only, I mean, there is going to be a very broad discussion about that. It's not going to be, I can only tell you this, it's not going to be my decision of how it has to be. It will be, uh, it will be a decision that will come out of many voices. So, but I can promise to you that there is going to be a process to, to bring those voices forward. And then so for, for me to hear exactly what the needs are, and then my promise to you would be that whatever I'm suggested to do, I will, as long as I don't violate any rules or laws. Beyond that, um, about you made reference to that committee, and I would like to ask my colleague to um, Fred if he could speak about this very specifically. Absolutely. One second, I want to make one yeah. point. The only violence that has been committed during political demonstrations on this campus, I can say absolutely and without a doubt, has been committed by the police and the administration against the Freedom of Expression Volunteer Program, which is a long name, but let me let me describe it if I might. And and quite frankly, it didn't work uh, uh, in any of those the three uh, events that you described. The idea of uh, of the student affairs folks is to try to do what we can. Quite frankly, I think Matt would agree on this: is to have us involved so the police are not involved. That's one of our our goals. Um, and as I say, it did not work um, in those three events. Um, it, it's designed around ensuring um, both the those that are demonstrating, and then sometimes, not, not in this case, and not in the three cases you've described, but also the counter-demonstration to, to work. So in some cases, we have demonstrations with counter-demonstrations you know, in opposing perspectives. So the idea is to try to develop a set of if you will, not policies as much as just processes that we can ensure and support that effort for freedom of speech. Now I know that the minute you hear that word team, and I certainly have had lots of conversations with folks about this, is, is, is it a group of spies? Is it, is it reporting? Is it is doing those things? That's not its intention. It's not its what, what we use it for. We try to use it for, to, to say that everything is fine here, everything is going well, don't worry, to send out those kind of messages. And again, I'm the first one to tell you that the three events you described, it did not work. It did not work. Um, there are campuses that, sadly, from my perspective, uh, have given up on this approach, having the student affairs folks try to, try to help with this. So we don't have to engage the police. They just stood back and said, let the police come. I know recently, um, sadly for me, um, some of my staff who have done this have um, not felt, felt not, not treated well uh, by the students. And so it's, it's going to be one of these areas, Charles, that I think we have to re-examine. Maybe something we just have to abandon. Uh, but that, that was the purpose of Um, hi, I have a question regarding to your plans for the future of UC Davis accessibility, but if I don't read what I wrote down, I'm going to get completely lost, so. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to dialogue with you. I believe you are participating now in what is a radical re-envisioning of what a university could look like when students take agency of their own education and their educational environment. I never saw something so humble on this campus as when you walked in total silence through a street full of impassioned protesters. Your presence for me is likely, validating my feelings of uh, anger and pain. I've never seen you all for the regents or higher ranking administration validate those, those feelings of anger and pain, which 
Their actions and corruption have caused all students. In fact, as a student, I often do not feel validated in my experience of this campus, and feeling that if tuition continues to increase, me and many of my peers may not be able to afford the education that has radically influenced my life and perception of the world, and consistently feeling as though to administration I am a number and diversity statistic. I do not feel validated in being cl classed out of this university, and I do not feel validated when I report vandalism like maricones in my dormitory and a faggy suck cock in my classrooms. And the UCPD does not validate this as homophobia and racism. I believe Friday's events represent the conflict of a university that is not yet aware of the conditions students deem appropriate in handling our issues. Students would not advocate for the use of uh, violence against student protesters, and I hope my fellow students would validate queer and, folk, and folks of color's feelings of safe, fear for safety and up on this campus. I implore you to take into consideration the immense knowledge and ingenuity of your students, their education we've received from, from world-class educators and faculty. My professors in Women and Gender Studies, Chicano Studies, have all exposed radical ideas for community-based safety initiatives. Use them, use us, foster growth and leadership in students like me and those much smarter in grad studies. We are at a pivotal moment in higher education. Let's collectively use our resources and increase university participation in your plans for UCPD reform, as well as for your future plans for the future funding of UC Davis. Make your reforms transparent. Make your 2020 initiative to increase the size of UC Davis while foregoing accessibility to California students, an increasing number of which are underrepresented students who were promised access to quality education only to graduate high school and find the UC privatized and inaccessible. Make those plans transparent. have an obligation to maintain this institution's dedication towards excellence and access. Um, and just passing along a note, the professors in Women and Gender Studies would love to meet you as you are a part of the department. Um, and I'd like to hear how you're including students in your plans for the, the 2020 initiative and um, increasing access to these ideas. So, um, specifically I was uh, in fact about uh, participating, there was some time ago if I had time to teach, I would love to do that, and there was a discussion of teaching, co-teaching a class in the program. <coughs> I want to say that. Um, about the 2020 initiative, we have uh, Ken Burtis, Professor Burtis, who is leading the activity, and all three um, groups that are, committees that are formed have students in there, very good student participation. So please email him, there are many students as you can imagine, and so they if you are interested, send him, it's Ken Burtis, he was the Dean of the School of Biological Sciences. Please send him an email saying that you're interested. But I agree, thank you for your comments. I just wanted to let you all know that whoever's in line right now are the last ones that are going to be able to speak tonight. Um, just be aware of that. I think there's room for one more person. And there's nine up there right now. So um, that'll be the rest of the students that get to speak for them. Okay, well, I'll try to make this really quick. Um, actually, it just needs a really direct answer. Um, I want to address some of the incongruencies in your statement, and this is for you, Chancellor. Um, you had said that under your chancellorship, there were each student's voice um, and each student's concern. <laughs> However, it's very directly appreciated and not very interesting. I, I will leave the last uh, question to Fred because there was the button question. Um, and I. Um, let me see, I'm trying to remember your, it's been a very, very long day. Yeah. So I, I asked, um, why is it that, you know, you didn't ever come down to talk to us, you know, like ask us our concerns, and you said during your speech yesterday, you know, I want to get to know all of you, but it didn't seem that you wanted to get to know us. But I, I said also today, um, and that's how it started, in fact, but in the question and answer period, that one thing that I learned is that I need to spend more time with the students. It is true, you're right, I, and I accept this, that I, whenever there are demonstrations, I did not get, I did not come to speak with the people who were 
in the gallery. I have, after I came to the rally, and I really, um, you know, I have to tell you, I will do that in the future. I really will. So that is my response to you on that issue. About, let me say a little bit about Saturday. Um, and the uh, and, and the decision to go. So this is the only facility, search two. It's the only facility that has facility, um, that has the in, uh, equipment for a press conference. And we wanted to do that because there were so many requests from the media, and there was no way that we could reach anyone individually. And that is the only place where um, there was uh, any equipment to do it. In the, it's a small as you know, building, and the room in there is small. I mean, for those of you who know Search too, and you are going to visit it and look at the room, it's a small room. Um, may I ask something? Um, we had the equipment to have a worldwide national news on our quad yesterday, and there was yes. enough equipment to accommodate all of this. So I have to do, so I, I accept that. I'm just telling you what was available to me on Saturday. That that was, in fact, there was a suggestion from our Office of Communications that was the place to go. And we went there, obviously it was not organized, in retrospect it could have been more in a bigger room, we just did not do that. Um, you can say why it was not intended to exclude people from that process. But when students came, um, we wanted to have only few, there's no space in that small room for to make the world out of media. And so that's what happened, really. So I just have to tell you. Um, I would like to ask, uh, to just tell a little bit about the particular issue of the discussion. About the bathrooms. Um, <laughs> so, because I'm, I'm sure I understand. Um, the concern was the bathroom was open or was not open the 24 hour room? Uh, no, the concern was that there was a statement saying that the police were called out because um, the encampment was initially unsafe because the facilities weren't open um, to students, such as bathrooms. Um, however, we do have a 24 hour study room within, and um, it takes just a moment's walk from the encampment. Um, that does have bathrooms that are open. So I wanted to address that incongruency in the statement that was made. You know, I don't, I don't have the, the statement in front of me, um, but that would be incongruent with my knowledge. That, to my knowledge, the 24 hour reading room should have been open, and the bathroom should have been accessible. We did. They were yeah. good. We did have. Um, we did have a discussion though of enough bathrooms. We, so that may be part of the part of the confusion. I don't know. Um, and you probably have noted that we have brought in porta potties. A lot, yet we, I can't remember when we brought them in last night. Last night helped support support the effort. So maybe maybe that was the the, the reason for the incongruity that you're no, discussing. No. <laughs> I'd like to ask that I can be recorded. <coughs> Chancellor Kadehi, I uh, observed your response over the first 72 hours, and I have observed your response tonight. I think tonight you have done a great job, or, or at least a good job, of uh, trying to acknowledge our concerns and making uh, some concrete proposals for what you can do to make things better. During the first 72 hours, however, there was no leadership, a lack of concrete proposals, all of the PR was botched and contradictory, and as a result, I came up with a list to help you. Ten things that you can do in the next 24 hours that will instill confidence, that will help you earn my trust and the trust of the other students here. Four of these I have heard tonight have already been accommodated, and I would like to thank the Chancellor and the other members of the I'd like to begin with redressing the victims. The first two you've already solved, and I'd like to acknowledge this. You have provided amnesty for the arrested protesters, and you've promised to pay for the medical bills. I appreciate this. However, I would also like to see several other things. I think it's important, most of all, that all five of the investigating task forces and committees have unfettered access to all of your communications from the last six months regarding any form of student protest. Additionally, they should have access to all of these communications from within the police department. That way we can know what was said, who said it, what was authorized, what wasn't. I think you also should publicly recommend that the police chief, Lieutenant Pike, 
Any officers between them and the chain of command be fired upon investigation's completion. First, publicly tell the regents that you oppose large fee hikes. Second, publicly ask the regents for a moratorium on any such hikes until there is time for the taxpayers, university stakeholders, students, faculty, staff, and other members of the UC community, like alumni, to make their voices heard. Finally, personally begin today. Commit to lobbying Sacramento and Washington for changes in the tax code. All right, so uh, I, as you know, I'm, I'm working very hard to advocate both here and in Washington in terms of supporting higher education. Can you be specific? So I have visited, you know, with whatever I can do within my power, right? So I have visited, every time I go to Washington, D.C., I go and visit people, um, our representatives. And what else do you do? I'm not a politician. I cannot write the rules. I'm sorry. I would I love to solve, I would love to solve the problems of Washington, D.C., but I can't. The only thing that I do is to frustrate me every time you know, I go and ask for a solution. But I go, and I go and I remind them why it is important to keep higher education very high up in terms especially of the Pell um, Grant that they give to our students because that's what we get from the federal government. And in terms of research primarily because it is critical to give it up. Now when we go to the state, and I have been speaking with representatives in their offices, outside of their offices, in the residence, everywhere, on the phone. I mean, they are trying to really explain why it is important to support higher education. And I will keep Does that include changes in tax policy? Well, of course we talk about that. Um, but I'd say we have a list of things we are giving them. Right? We cannot advocate for one solution only, but we provide them with a list. And we do it, we, we keep doing this. My frustration last year is that I believe I saw that they were disengaged from these discussions. I'm just telling them. But I keep, and it's all of us as a matter of fact, we are involved in those with students. There are many students who are involved in this. So that, I can tell you, I will continue and I will continue with a lot of intensity. In terms of tuition increases, not just me, all the chancellors, we have indicated to President Udo and to the state that keep increasing tuition the way we have is unsustainable. They know that. And so um, I will continue with that message. And I can just promise you that. The, um, the one thing I want to come to, you said that we have to fire individuals. So I understand where you are coming from. I'm asking you to recommend that, yes. All right. Yeah. Now, do, after the report. Yes. Let me just say one thing. We'll follow the report. There are four or five, five reports. And I really believe that there is going to, the truth is going to come out. And there will be very specific recommendations about how to place the appropriate penalties for the wrongdoings. <coughs> what I cannot do, or anyone here, is to really um, violate the trust in us in terms of following due process. Our institution is held together by that promise that everyone deserves the right to be looked at carefully and to be given due process. And so we cannot take this away because we put all of us at risk. And the only thing I can tell you is that I will follow due process to the fullest. And so that is my promise. It is 7 o'clock, so if we can try to um, keep questions really short. Um, there are people that do need to leave, and we want to go to everyone too long, so uh, please.
Thank you. And the other officers that were involved. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
thank you. And I would really want to urge everyone that is sitting at this panel to look over this resolution. There are some very important and clear demands that we list in here. And I wish I had the time to go over all of them, but you can find it. You can ask me for it. I'll get it to you also. Um, it can be found on our ASUC website because I think that these are all matters that need to be taken into serious consideration and be acted. And we need to proactively work on all of the demands that we request in this Senate resolution. So thank you very much for listening to everyone's comments as well. Thank you. Um, hi. Um, I would just like to start by saying that I wish to not be recorded, so please don't record.
I mean, I think that just everyone in here probably agrees with everything you just said. So that was great. <laughs> I just wanted to say uh, that I thank you so much for being here this evening. I personally have um, gained tremendously from this discussion and I just hope that we can do this. We can continue with those. There are a lot of things and as you know we have 32,000 students on this campus. And as Jason said, it's the silent majority that we need to reach out to. And so, bureaucratic at all by our process. We just weren't sure how many people were going to be here. We wanted to make sure everyone got to speak who wanted to speak. But I'm definitely for everything Jason said, and we're excited that you all came out tonight, and we hope to be seeing some changes at our campus.